Let me just ask you a quick question. Show of hands, how many of you have ever dealt with a difficult person in your life before? Anybody ever been frustrated with anyone? Ever? Yeah, do me a favor. Keep your hands up real quick and look around the room. All right. <laughs> we, got, we got a couple of pointing. That wasn't really my goal here. <laughs> but, but I want you to notice a pattern as you looked around the room is that every single one of us have come in contact with somebody before who was a challenge to deal with. And I need you to know that that's not exclusive to just this room. In 2017, Psychology Today published a study where they interviewed 10,000 people. And out of those 10,000 people, they found that the average person could name, name specifically, 10 people in their life who were a challenge to either be around or work with. So here's what that points to. In your life, you are going to come in contact with difficult people. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when you're going to be faced with somebody that's a little bit of a challenge. And here's the deal. That can be discouraging, that can be frustrating, and for some of you that may even be a little intimidating. But I don't think it has to be. We're continuing our series game plan, and we're going to be looking in 1 Thessalonians 5 today. So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, you can go ahead and open up there. And we're going to be looking at a passage that Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica. And I think that this is a group of people that we can really heavily relate with and empathize with. Now, a little bit of background about them is that church, uh, Paul started the church in Thessalonica on his second missionary journey. And so he writes 1 Thessalonians a few months after he starts that journey. And so in between the time of his initial visit to Thessalonica and the writing of 1 Thessalonians, the church in Thessalonica has been growing like crazy. They're really growing in numbers. But in the middle of that happening, several things have happened. First, they have suddenly become obsessed with the concept of the second coming of Christ, and they really struggle with it. But in the middle of them also dealing with that, they have people that have died unexpectedly. They've been persecuted, and that persecution does not go away. And in the middle of all that, they have a group of Christians who are taking advantage of the rich Christians, and they're not working, they're just depending on them to live. And so in the midst of dealing with their own faith issues, they're dealing with death, persecution, and being taken advantage of. And so Paul, he writes this letter to do a couple of things. One, he wants to encourage them and teach them about what the second coming of Christ is, but he also uses a portion of this letter to talk to them about the ways that they could deal with the people they're struggling with. And I think this is a really important topic for us to talk about today. Because here's the reality for every single one of us, is that difficult people aren't a rarity, they're an inevitability in life. And how you handle them matters. So the good news for you today is that if you've ever struggled with a difficult person before, you're not alone in that. And not only are you not alone in that, Paul wrote this passage specifically to help people like you understand how to deal with these things. So my prayer is that as we jump into Scripture today and we walk through this, that you would leave with a little bit of encouragement and wisdom on some ways that you can turn these negative interactions into meaningful moments of growth for you and for others. So let's jump into our Scripture. We're going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians 12, or 5, and we're going to start with verses 12 and 13. It says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work, and live in peace with each other. So Paul's going to start off this little section with the easy stuff. He says, listen, you've got some good people in your life who are doing some really good things. So these are people like Timothy who came with Paul. These are the other missionaries that Paul sent. And these are the servants in the church. And so he says, look, these people, you should be loving and honoring and recognizing them. And for the church in Thessalonica, and, and even for us, well, this is really easy, right? I mean, love people who are doing good, honor people who are doing good, done deal. I can do that in my sleep. And I would venture to say that most of you do not struggle to honor the good people in your life. But is it Christ-like for our love to stop with just the people who deserve it? Well, I would say no, and Jesus would say no. Look at what Jesus tells his disciples in Luke 6. This is starting with verse 32. It says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those who, from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. So Jesus tells his disciples, he says, look, loving and serving people, that's a really good thing. 
But if you're only doing that with the people that deserve it, he says, even sinners treat people well that treat them well. Even sinners love good people. Even sinners will lend to people if they know that they're expecting things back. So what good is it for us just to do that? But here's the deal. I think this fits so well with the culture or what our culture is teaching us nowadays. Because coming out of the pandemic, we made this big shift in our culture to this me first idea. And I think some good things came out of that. Because things like self-care became prevalent for the first time in a long time. You had people that learned to self-advocate for themselves and, and stand up for themselves in ways they had not before. But there's also been some increasingly negative effects of this shift in our culture. And so one of the big ones is that our culture teaches us that everything is based on mutual interactions. And so what that means is that if someone treats you well, then they deserve to be in your life and you should be in their life. And if they respect you, you should respect them. But if not... They don't deserve you. Cut them off. Well, I would say two things about that. First, I would warn you not to think so highly of yourself that you start to weigh the actions of people around you as to whether or not they deserve your love and friendship. And two, I would say that this is not only incredibly unbiblical, but I think it's counter to everything that Jesus teaches us. In fact, look at what Jesus says when he continues in Luke 6. He says, but love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be the children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. And so what Jesus says, listen, it's not that we just love those who deserve us, because that's what the culture tells us to do, but it's that we love and serve people no matter what they do, whether they deserve it or not. He says in this, not only does God say that we are blessed and that we are called children of God, but this is also the very way that people see the love of God through us. And so this is a really important thing for us to do. So the step one with loving difficult people is we got to love them. So how can we do that? How can we love and serve difficult people well when they're difficult? Well, let's start. Let's look at the end of verse 13, and we're going to start here. The first thing that Paul says and how we can do this, he says that we can live in peace with each other. Now, this is a really big step for many of you, and I will say this is the first step that many of you need to take. When you're faced with a difficult person, stop arguing with them. And I know that that's a really hard thing to do, because if we're being honest with ourselves, people can be irritating. I love my wife. My wife loves me. But here's something fun I found out about myself a couple of months ago. When we're asleep at night, sometimes she gets up in the middle of the night, and she'll go get water or run to the bathroom. And I have this thing that I do where I, like, roll slightly over in the covers, and I kind of wrap myself up like a burrito. It's unconscious. I have no idea I'm doing this. But I will tell you that it's really comfy. But when I do that, Hannah, she can't get under the covers anymore. And so naturally she walks in, she gets a little irritated, and she does what any loving wife would do. And she yanks the covers out from under me. And so this jolts me awake, and now I'm irritated because I'm like, why did you wake me up, and why did you steal the covers from me? And then I quickly realize, you didn't steal them from me, I stole them from you. And we come to a mutual agreement that we'll share the covers like normal human beings. But here's why I say that is that even people that we love deeply can irritate us sometimes. So if they can do that, then you need to be really well aware of the fact that there are going to be people in your life that will frustrate you to the point of exhaustion. And so sometimes those people even do that on purpose. Now, there's a phrase in the Internet that talks about this. It's called, don't feed the trolls. And here's what that phrase means. It means stop adding fuel to the fire. And this is something that I would say that most of us in this room struggle with in some way or another. Some of us struggle with it in person. A lot of us struggle with it online because there's some of you in this room that feel that if you could just argue for three hours and 30 paragraphs with that random atheist on Facebook who attacked Christianity, that you change his opinion on things. But I need you to understand why this kind of stuff backfires on us, whether that's in real life or things online. Look at what Proverbs 9, 7 through 8 says about this. It says, whoever corrects a mocker invites insults, and whoever rebukes the wicked incurs abuse. Don't rebuke mockers or they'll hate you. Rebuke the wise and they'll love you. And so we have this natural tendency to want to correct the people that are instinctively and intentionally causing conflict in our life. And so here's what this proverb says, is that if you want to try to correct somebody who is intentionally insulting you, well, get ready to be insulted some more because their goal is to insult you. 
And so this way, you've got to stop feeding the trolls. If you don't want the troll to stick around, stop giving it food to fuel its energy. And the same thing's true with difficult people in our life. You have to stop giving people the energy to be difficult. And so this means that you have to be the bigger person. It means that you've got to be willing to do things differently. And some of you may look at me and you say, look, Chris, I, I get what you're saying. I understand it, but they started it, okay? They called me out. They said this thing to my friend. They did this horrible thing. But here's what Paul says in response to that. Paul says, no, live in peace. And the better translation of that is actually bring the peace. And so here's what that means, is that if you're a Christian, you have an obligation in every unpeaceful moment, every negative situation, every instance of conflict in your life. You are the one that has the obligation to turn that into a peaceful situation. It means that you're supposed to be the one that resolves the conflict, not stirs it up. And so that means that when you're faced with a difficult person, bring the peace. It means be the bigger person. Forgive somebody even when you don't feel like they deserve it. Be the first person to reconcile instead of waiting on that other person. It means choosing not to argue even when you really want to. But above all, it means that we show them the love and forgiveness of God because of the same love that was afforded to us. All right, well, let's keep reading. So we're going to jump and look at verses 14 and 15. And in these verses, as we talk about this, Paul is going to talk about a couple of different things. He's going to look at a couple of different types of difficult people and some ways that we can deal with them. So let's start with verse 14. It says, And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. So we'll stop there. So let's talk about idle people first. I don't care if you're a Christian or you have no idea nor any care who Jesus is. Laziness is laziness. And it's not a shocker to anybody in this room that lazy people can be a really big burden on us sometimes. But where we have to be careful is that we're not supposed to just warn them, we're supposed to help them. But before we get into that, let's start with what the Bible has to say about laziness. So there are tons of Proverbs on this and tons of verses, but we're going to look at just two. Proverbs 10.4 says that lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. And Proverbs 12.24 says diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in forced labor. So whether you're a Christian or not, here's two hard truths that the Bible gives you about laziness. Is that laziness leads to a hard life. So we know that, and we want to warn people about that, right? But I don't think it's enough that we just warn people. Because here's the deal. We can tell people all day long about how bad laziness is and about how horrible the effects of it are on someone's life. But if we aren't doing anything to help fix their laziness, what good is that? And so what I think that we should do is that we need to teach people how to do things right. We need to start instilling and correcting good habits in people. And there's tons of different ways you guys can do this. I know one of the biggest ones that I've seen is people will give lazy people jobs or give them second chances. My brother is a great example of that. When he was a freshman in college, he made some really bad decisions, and he flunked out of college in his freshman year. And somebody chose to give my brother a second chance. They offered him the opportunity to enroll in a secondary redemption program. And my brother ended up doing it, going through it, getting his degree, and now he works full-time as a mechanic and is working his way up in the car care side of a car dealership back in Mississippi. And he's doing really good. But somebody had to take that chance with him, but when they did, it changed his life. Now, for many of you, you may not be able to get people jobs or help people get degrees, and I get that, but there are still tons of things that you can do to help people. One of the biggest things you can do is instill good habits in people. Uh, if any of you know who Charlie Diaz is, one of our church members, I love what he's been doing lately. He has taken a couple of guys in our church, and he's getting them to work out with him early in the mornings before work. And if you've ever seen Charlie's biceps, you know that he doesn't put them through kitty workouts. He is working these guys to death. I mean, Sean comes in half the time just like wore out and sore and just be like, dude, I don't want to live anymore. But, but here's what I love about that is that you can instill good habits in people, whether you're talking about a chronic couch potato or somebody who just wants to do some better things in their life. And so we can help fight laziness before it ever even sets in. But the way that we do that is by instilling good habits, because if you'll do that, those negative moments of warning actually become positive moments of reinforcement where we get to teach good things. And so if you want to help lazy people, the best thing you can do is help teach them good habits. Now, let's talk about disruptive people. So disruptive people, I think we need to break into two categories. We're going to break them into disruptive non-Christians and disruptive Christians. Because those two different distinctions will change the way that we're supposed to approach people. 
So with disruptive Christians, in, or non-Christians in particular, I think that we need to go back to Paul's initial command to bring peace. Because our goal as Christians is not to force the world into obedience. The goal is that we would lead people to Jesus. And we do that through our love and our service, and then we get to share the truth of Jesus. But as we do that, I also need to remind you that you don't need to feed the trolls. So if somebody is disruptive, you need to handle that situation with grace. And that means that you need to show them the love and the forgiveness of Jesus because they're not acting Christ-like, but you can't expect them to because they're not Christ-like. So that's where we afford the grace. But if you do that and the person continually causes you problems, walk away. And Jesus has a great example of this. He does this in Mark 8, 11 through 13. It says, when the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus to test him, they even asked him for a sign from heaven. And he sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no signs will be given to it. Then he left. He got back in the boat and he crossed to the other side. And I love this story because Jesus is just done. Right? The Pharisees show up, and they want to test Jesus, and they want to cause this big scene, and Jesus just leaves. Why? He's Jesus. Here's why. Because he knew that arguing with the Pharisees in that moment it wasn't going to change their mind. They were there to cause conflict. So Jesus made a choice. He knew that it was more important for him to go make disciples, so he left. So I'll ask you this question in terms of disruptive non-Christians. What's more important to you? Building the kingdom of God or getting into petty arguments that go nowhere? Show love and grace, but don't feed the trolls. Now, if we're talking about a disruptive Christian, this is going to change our approach a little bit because on the front end, we have to show them the same love and forgiveness that Jesus has commanded us. But because we're talking about a Christian, we actually have obligations as Christians to help lovingly correct issues like division and disruption. In fact, Paul actually talks to Titus about this in Titus 3 through 11. He says, warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful and they are self-condemned. Now, we need to break this down a little bit and we need to start here. I need you to do a little bit of self-reflection for a moment because before we can ever hope to deal with disruption and division, we need to be sure that we're not the cause of that disruption and division because Jesus says that before you can ever take the speck out of your brother's eye, you need to take the log out of yours. So here's a really good test to figure out who's causing the division. Is your concept or idea that you're fighting for, are you the only one doing it? If everybody else is different and it's you, pretty good chance you're the one causing the division. So if that's the case, that's where you need to start. That's the issue you need to fix. But if you realize in this that, hey, I'm not the one causing the issue. There is something going on with this person. That's where we're called to step in and help this person. So here's the first step you're supposed to do with this. The first step is that you go talk to them in private. And so you need to be willing to have a civil conversation with this person about the issues at hand. And this has to be step one. Because if you actually leave and you don't talk to this person and you go complain about it to other people, that's gossip. You just sinned against God and that person. But instead, you can talk to them first. Now, it is okay, I will say. You can ask people for advice on how to handle that situation or how to approach it. But the first step that you need to take in actually talking with anyone is talking with that person. Now, if the person remains divisive or disruptive at that point, step number two is you bring someone else into it. This can be a friend, it can be someone you trust, your pastor, or somebody that maybe was a witness to the situation. They just need to be able to speak into it. And the two of you go talk with this person in private. If the issue still isn't resolved, that's when you're supposed to bring the church in. So that's where you bring it to the attention of the pastors and people like Nathan and I can handle and try to deal with that conflict ourselves. And if after all of that, they're still divisive. Have nothing to do with them. And if that sounds harsh or unbiblical, that is the exact word-for-word -word model for confrontation that Jesus gave us in Matthew 18. And here's why Jesus does that. Because you can't waste your time on people whose only goal is to cause drama. There's more important things to do. 
And so if, that, if somebody is consistently and intentionally causing division and disruption, step away. You love them, you forgive them, but step away. Now, if they come back, forgive them, accept them with open arms. But if they want to continually cause problems and drama, you have bigger things to worry about in the kingdom of God. You do. Now, let's look at the next type of person. Continuing verse 14, Paul says that we are to encourage the disheartened. Now, that word disheartened has a little bit more of a complex meaning. It is actually a Greek word that Paul created with two Greek words. I'm not going to try and make you spell these out, but it's oligos and suke. You can go look this up if you want to. And what that word translates to, it's a combination of two words. It means a little or weak soul. And so this is probably too narrow of a translation here, and it'd probably be better translated as encourage or comfort the weak souls. And this is a really big thing for us to talk about in 2022. There's a study done by the Global Burden of Disease Organization where they found that coming out of the pandemic, they did a survey and and found that worldwide, this is not just America, this is worldwide, there was a 28% rise in major depressive disorders and a 26% rise in anxiety disorders. Now, I want to remind you that difficult people, they're not a rarity, they're an inevitability. And so that means for you in your life, if you look at the people in your life, there's a really, really good chance that some or maybe even a lot of those people are hurting pretty badly. But here's where that statistic also gets interesting, is that while anxiety and depression has risen across the world, in most countries, the suicide rate either remained the same or actually decreased. And so here's what that tells us is that people are hurting, but they want help. And if we're going to be the church that Jesus has called us to be, then we have to be on the forefront of helping those people. Now, I think there's a couple of ways that you guys can do this really well. The first one I want to encourage you to do is to be a presence in their life because your presence is comforting. And here's what I mean by this. I don't mean that you need to try to always speak wisdom in their life because a lot of times when someone's hurting or they're going through something difficult, they don't need to hear about why good things happen to bad people or about how God can use this plan or how God has a reason for everything that happens. They just need you to be there. And so the best thing that you can do in that moment on your end is tell them you love them, tell them God loves them, and say, hey, You're not alone, and you're going to get through this. And just be a presence for them, because that's a huge comfort for them. Second thing you can do is you can pray for them. You guys are probably going to get tired of hearing this from us on the stage, because I can't even tell you how many times we've said it in recent weeks. But prayer is powerful. Prayer is really, really powerful. And so one of the first steps that we should take when we know that people are hurting is to pray with and for them. Now, I hope you guys know that when you guys do write prayer requests down on things like our Connect cards or text us, We don't just throw those away like in the trash can on Monday morning. We actually take those and we intently and actively pray for you guys because we want to be able to walk through these things with you when you're dealing with stuff and when you're hurting and struggling. And that same thing can be true for you. You can do that same thing for the people around you that you know are hurting. You can pray with and for them because prayer is real, it's powerful, and it makes a difference. Now, here's the last thing that you can do to help those and encourage the weak souls. Encourage them to seek professional help. Because prayer is powerful, and your presence is comforting, but God gave us counselors and physicians for a reason. It's that they're really, really good at their jobs, and they're really, really good at helping people that struggle with mental health. And so what we need to be able to do is is encourage them to go this way. Because some of you in this room, you've got a friend or you know somebody that's a loved one that's struggling with something really bad. Maybe they're struggling with suicidal thoughts or depression or they're just struggling with anxiety. And you've been praying for God to give them a miracle. You've been praying God to work a miracle in their life. And that's great. But know that God could choose to work that miracle through a professional. And so we need to encourage people to take this step because it can be a really big thing that helps them. So... Be a presence, pray for them, encourage them to seek help. That's a really big things that we can do. Now, here's the next people we can help. These are the last type of difficult person we're going to talk about today, and that is help the weak. Now, when Paul says weak, he's talking specifically here about a weak spiritually or morally weak person. And so this is the person that maybe just gave their life to Christ, or they're just a really, really immature Christian. So these are the people that they've got a lot of sin in their life. They're working through some things. Their theology is really weak. They can't really tell you much about God except they love him. 
And these are probably the same people that they just don't know what they're doing. And so it's easy for us to have a natural response of kind of like an eye roll and be like, oh, this person. Because these are the people that I'll be honest with you. They're going to come to your small group, and they're going to give you weird answers. They're going to say the wrong things, and they're going to do the wrong things. And their actions and their words, they're not always going to line up with Jesus. But here's where I think the church has to step up in that. When we're talking about people who are new to their faith, they're young and immature, we're called to make disciples. And so when we're faced with people who don't know what they're doing, we have a deep obligation and command from God to teach them. And so I'm going to say something, I'm going to be really honest with you for a second, and it might hurt your feelings, and if it does, I love you, but you'll be all right. If you're a mature Christian, and you are not actively discipling someone, you are not only missing out on the calling that God placed on your life, but you're wasting the life that he gave you. And you need to stop waiting on someone else to do it for you. Because it's not that some people are called to make disciples. We're all called to make disciples. And so if you're here and you go, Chris, I get that. I would love to make a disciple. No idea how to do it. No idea what I'm doing. That's great. That's okay. But that's probably a really good indicator that you need to be discipled. And so if that's you, when we have a moment of invitation in the back, come talk to me because I can talk with Nathan and we can help find you someone who can mentor you and disciple you through that so that you can do this. But here's what we've got to do. We've got to be the church. We've got to be the church. Let's not leave our young and new Christians to figure things out on their own. But let's help them. Let's teach them and help them to become confident, mature followers of Christ because that's what we're called to do. So here's the last thing that Paul's going to tell us today. He says, be patient with everyone and make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. So when we're talking about how to interact and help difficult people, we need to understand that this is a long and a hard process. That there are going to be moments that are frustrating There are going to be moments where you're annoyed and irritated, and these people may even hurt you. But this is why Paul writes this reminder. He says, listen, you're doing good work. You're doing good things. If you do this right, you're helping them. But you've got to be patient. Because to see that change in people, it's going to take some time. And so in all of that difficulty, if we choose to be patient and we'll love and serve them continually, I think we'd be amazed at the things we'll see God do for them and change their lives. Yeah, before I came on staff here, I worked in student ministry in various capacities for about seven years. And in that seven years, in, in different schools and churches and summer camps and all those things, I have worked with some really difficult kids over that time. But my first years as a student pastor, my first two years in particular, were the most difficult years of my life. I worked in inner city Jackson, Mississippi, in an area that was incredibly impoverished, and it had one of the highest crime rates in the country. And about a year and a half into working there, we grew our student ministry to about 60 kids, uh, which was awesome. But as that number of kids grew, so did the concentration and number of kids that were struggling with some really, really heavy issues. And so it was not uncommon for me to have kids that constantly started fights. I had kids that pulled guns. I had kids that were having babies at 13 and 15 years old, kids that came from horrible home lives and so many other things. And I'm going to be honest with you, every Wednesday night that I showed up for church for students was a battle. There was always some kind of problem I had to put out, always some kind of issue to resolve. And I would leave most nights beat down, exhausted, and discouraged. And I would have to go home and pray, and I would say, God, just give me patience give me passion, just bring these people to know you, please. In two years that I worked there, I am so thankful to say that out of those kids, 17 of them who gave me so many problems ended up giving their life to Christ. I watched kids walk into church on Sunday mornings who had never set foot in a church before. 
I watched kids pray for the first time. I watched kids open Bibles. I watched kids want to study about Jesus. And as hard as those two years were, it was worth every bit of knowing that even just for some of them, their eternities were changed. And here's the thing. That same thing is true for you. You guys can have that same kind of impact in people because you're going to come in contact with difficult people. Difficult people aren't a rarity. They're an inevitability in life and how you handle them matters. And so if you'll take the opportunity and the time to love on and serve and show grace and be patient with the difficult people in your life, you can become a really, really big part of a process that changes their life forever. And listen, that's, that's what God blesses. Yeah, I don't think God ever wants you to have a quiet life by removing all the frustrating people out of it. I think he wants your life to be impactful. And he wants your life to be blessed. But I don't think those blessings are material things. Because I think one of the greatest blessings you can ever have in your life is watching somebody that you've worked with completely change their life. So don't miss out on that opportunity. Love the difficult people. Serve them well. Show them grace and forgiveness. And teach them to do good things. Because you will be amazed and what will happen, and you will be able to watch people's futures and maybe even their eternities change. Let's pray.